So tonight you guys are in for a treat. We have what's called five on five. That means we've got five of our pastors preaching a five-minute message. Five on five. It's going to be lit. Who's ready for that word? Would you please stand up to your feet? And we're just going to pray and just jump on in. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you that your spirit is here. We thank you that your presence. And I pray, Father, that as our pastors begin to speak tonight, that you would begin to speak. Lord, in those five minutes, you can do more in five minutes than what we could try to do in a lifetime. So, Holy Spirit, I pray that you move. I stand as a pen in the hand of a ready writer. Father, bless all of our pastors. Use us tonight in Jesus' name. And everybody says... Amen, amen. You may be seated, and the clock starts now. So I want to let you guys know that I have the honor and privilege of being the first one up, and I just want to encourage you guys that this Sunday, we start our new series in the book of Daniel entitled, I'm on my I'm on my way. And so we're so excited about it, and I really just want to give you guys just a brief overview and lay the groundwork for our pastors who to come, uh, and I just want to let you guys know what you're in store for. The first thing that you guys are in store for is that in this series, you're going to learn how to have an excellent spirit. What does it mean to have an excellent spirit? The next thing you're going to learn is how to walk in the favor of the king. Notice that it's a capital K. That means how are you going to walk in the favor of God? The next thing that you're going to learn is how to live with wisdom and understanding about your future. All of us need wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. How many of you know that you have a future? So we're going to find out how do you walk in that wisdom. The next thing we're going to learn is how to overcome the lions in the dens of life. How do you overcome the lions in the dens of life in those dark areas of where you're at? And lastly, we're going to talk about how to carry a distinguished spirit above all others. That means that you're separated. There's something different about the way you walk. There's something different about the way you talk. How do you carry a distinguished spirit? What sets you apart so that God can begin to bless you in your life? And in order to do this, I wanted to just lay out some things. There are three things that I want to give you in the next three minutes that you're going to learn. The first thing that that I want you guys to understand is that we have to be an inviter. That's right. you got to be an inviter. To invite means it's a friendly request. If you know that something good is coming, you want to let somebody know what's happening. You want to be able to invite them to let them know, look, there's a future for your life, and I want to invite you. Be friendly about it. Don't be mean. Don't be weird about it. Don't try to slide into the cubicle like, hey, neighbor. You know, you just want to be cool about it. Be chill and be friendly. The next thing that you want to do is you want to be involved. What does that mean? The word involved means to draw in. You want to be able to include them in this series. One of the great things that you want to do is you want to involve them in what you're doing. How do you draw somebody in? You've got to be enticing. You mentioned about, hey, do you believe that there's something more for your life? They're going to say, absolutely. Well, if you believe there's something more for your life, can I invite you to this series that we're talking about at our church? It has everything jam-packed about your future, where you're going to go, how can you get there, how can you get favor with your bosses, how can you get favor with men, how can you set yourself apart so you can have more in your life? You have to be enticing to draw them in. Amen? And the last thing that you want to do is you want to invest. The word invest means to devote one's time, effort, or energy with the expectation of a worthwhile result. In other words, you want to look at them and say, this is an investment. You need to invest your time and your effort and your energy with the expectation of a worthwhile result. If you knew that their life would be changed, that you have to paint the picture that you need to expect God to do something great. Why? Because your expectation determines God's visitation in your life. When you raise your expectation level, God will meet you there. You cannot go any higher than your expectation level. And so with that being said, we have to expect God to do something big. And this happens because it's an investment. Pastor Jason Lozano spoke about it. He says, this is how we make God rich. And how many of you know that when you have an investment, there's an ROI or a return on your interest? So when you begin to change people's life, that one person's life that is changed could actually become a return on interest when God looks at what you're doing. When he says, hey, look, you've poured into their life, so let me pour into your life. God, I believe in this saying that simply says this, is that when you take care of God's house, he'll take care of 
your house. And so in this series on the East Campus and the West Campus, there is a charge in the atmosphere. We are so excited about what God is doing. You learned it at Multiply. You saw it all last week. If you haven't felt it, the charge in the atmosphere, God is moving you from where you are to where you're going. And if all the obstacles come up against you and everybody asks, what power do you have to do this? What can you do in your life to get you there? You just have to look them in the face, adjust yourself, look them squarely in their eye, and let them know that I'm on. Oh, let's try it again. I'm on. I'm on. I want you guys to get excited because our pastors are going to lay out a word in these next five minutes. Get your pens ready, write quick, get it going, because guess what? God is on the move, and when everything comes up against you, just smile at the devil and let him know, I'm Come on, God bless you guys, and get ready for the next pastor. Good evening, good evening, Destiny Church. I am so honored to stand before you, and they already started my minutes, so I'm done, okay? <laughs> if I could get Josh to put up my scripture for tonight, it's found in Romans 15 and 13, and it reads, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. What I wanted to do was to, something a little bit different. I would like to invite you guys on a journey with me, and I want you to have lunch with me, okay? For lunch, we're going to have a PJ&H sandwich. We're going to have an ice-cold bottle of living water that never stops flowing. Number one, P is for peace, the peace that surpasses all our understanding, and we'll get back to that. The J is for joy. The joy of the Lord is my strength. And the H is for hope. The hope of God that we have everlasting life and that he meets all of our needs. Now, this little sandwich that I'm sharing with you guys, I know there's going to be enough of it for each and every one of you because if the little boy who gave up the lunch for the multitudes who were there listening to Jesus, 5,000 men were fed, plus women, plus children, I know you guys are going to eat some of my lunch and we're all going to get full tonight, amen? Amen. So when we go back and start talking about peace that surpasses your understanding, as I was digging into the text and I was reading, I found out that there's conditions on having that peace that surpasses your understanding. The condition is you must acknowledge God in prayer, taking everything to him, believing and receiving that which God has for you. Because if you're not going to take everything to God in prayer, if you're not going to praise him while you're going through, then you're not going to have that peace. Amen? Amen. And we all need peace because God knows that I've been through some things in my life that I should have probably lost my mind, but because of God's peace that kept me, I am here to stand and share with you today. And right now we're going to move on to J, the J part of our sa sandwich, the joy. The joy of the Lord is my strength. When we're on our way on this journey, we're going to need joy. We're going to need strength. And this joy, unspeakable joy, everlasting joy, overflowing joy, joy that flows like a river that's all bubbled up inside of me, it's going to take me on down to hope. Now, hope, the way the world looks at it, is you're hoping for something. You may get it and you may not get it. But guess what, Christians? Guess what? We got the inside track because our hope is in Christ Jesus. Amen? And because of Christ Jesus, we are guaranteed to get that which we are hoping for according to the will of God that worketh in us. And, you know, I wanted to share one more little thing. You know, we got this water. Remember when Jesus gave water to the Sumerian woman at the well and how he was able to quench her thirst? 
All of you that are thirsty today, thirst no more because the living water in Jesus Christ is here to fill you up to overflowing. So stop going around crying tears and salt because our tears are made out of salt. They don't accomplish anything. But if we drink from the well that overflows that God gives us, we shall thirst no more. And there's one more little thing I want to add here. I was looking through the story of Abraham and Sarah. You know Sarah had that laugh of faith. Everyone talks about Sarah's laugh of faith, but they never talk about the scripture that followed the laugh of faith. In my studies, I found out the guy was a little ticked off with Sarah, that she was laughing at him as if he couldn't do what he said he was going to do. Amen? He even asked Abraham, did I hear Sarah laughing at me? Does she not know there is nothing too difficult for my Lord that what I say I'm going to do, and if you believe, you will receive in Jesus' name? Amen? Amen. My closing, my closing remarks, because I'm two seconds over. My closing remark is this. If you will allow the Lord to do things in you, he'll work everything out. Because you know what he told Abraham? He said, tell uh, Sarah this for me. I'll be back here this time next year, and she will have a son. Good night. My God, there's a story about a, a U.S. Air Force fighter who is out in Afghanistan, and he, uh, he has several stories. I like this one in particular because he talks about a dark night, August 16, 2002. American troops are marching into Afghanistan in the dark night, pitch black, can't see nothing. They're going right into a, a canyon, into a valley. And you can hear nothing but, but quiet. It's a scary night for the American troops. True story. And as, they, as they're on their way, they've been equipped with everything they need to succeed in their mission. They've been given a mission. They have been called. They accepted the call. They've been chosen. And as they're on their way through that canyon, of course, you could imagine carrying their weapons, carrying their backpacks, scary, nervous. They don't know what's awaiting them. You know, it reminds me of someone like you and I. God called you. You accepted the call. He chose you for a mission. He's equipped you. He's giving you, giving you every weapon that you need to overcome. You will be successful. You, you, you will overcome. You see, what, what the American troops don't know is that in the crevices and the caves of this mountain, there is terrorist snipers waiting on them waiting for the opportune time to take them out for a moment of weakness, for distraction to come against them. They don't know they're waiting for them. You see, and one of the things that these American fighters have been equipped with is relentless faith. Relentless faith, because they're not going back. They're not going back. It reminds me of destiny. We're not going back. We're only going forward. I don't care what it looks like. It might look dark in that canyon. It might, it might look scary, but we're not going back. And so the Bible says that that we walk by faith and not by sight. Therefore, it don't matter how it looks. You got you to gotta keep walking. You got to keep walking. It might be scary, but you got to keep walking. But this is what I love about the story is the fact that what those terrorist snipers don't know is high above the clouds beyond them. There sits two A-10 Warhawk American airplanes. What they're doing is they're hovering, waiting to protect the troops on the ground. You know, I love the story because it reminds me of you and I, that right here on the ground, things look scary. Things look like, you know, 
you, you've been walking, you took the step, the next step, and the next step, and, and, and you accepted the call, and you said, Jesus, I'm going for it. This year is going to be a great year of multiplication, a year of the whole moments, but yet the enemy has been waiting for you. But what the enemy needs to know is what you know, is that right above the clouds is Jesus, and he's watching over you. He sends his angels to protect you, for he says, though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you shall fear no evil, because he is with you. And so I love that. And they don't know that, but yet they're going through it. You see, but what I believe that happens when you believe in Jesus and when Jesus is on your side, what you have with you is unbelievable favor. Unbelievable favor is what the world cannot believe. How does it happen? Who, who's on your side? I don't understand how things work for good for your life. I, I don't get it. You, you're always at church. You're always, you know, giving money. You're always, you know, like, like doing things for others. And yet your life is like, you know, you got problems and, and you got a smile on your face. It's called unbelievable favor to the world. Amen. You see Psalms 5, 12, it says that, that the Lord will bless the righteous and he will surround them with favor as what? As with a shield. You see, you're not alone. You got protection. You got the favor of God. It's on your side, son and daughter of God. The favor of the Lord goes before you. You see, what I like about the story is the fact that at the end of that night, those, those Warhawk planes came down right, be, right in the nick of time, right before the, the American troops were shot at and, and destroyed. Because in, 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 in the midst of that dark night, in, where there was no vision of the skies above the clouds, those, those, those planes came down and, and, and destroyed everyone else and allowed those 22 American soldiers to come home safe. You see, Jesus says in his word in John 8, 36, that... that if the Lord, make, if the Son sets you free, you will be free for sure. You see, and that's the last thing they were carrying with them is enduring freedom. Why? Because of their mission. You see, they have been set free from those, from those terrorist fighters. But yet on their mission, it was written that they were out to set others free. Freedom was not just freedom for them, but it was freedom for someone else. And you see, you and I as a church, we got to arise believing and standing and knowing that Jesus set us free to remain free. He set us free not to, long, not to go back, not to look our, at our past, not to look at our circumstances. We have been set free from the mindset of the past of sin. You are free, son and daughter. You are free. And you are free to free others. We're believing. We're expecting for a great year. This year, you shall remain with relentless faith, unbelievable favor, and relentless freedom. God bless you. Amen. Woo. Man, we've just, to follow those three, wow, that was, that, that's a blessing. You know, we've just come out of Multiply, and one of the biggest things that I got out of it was balance and momentum. How do I take balance, and how do I keep my momentum? But then as I began to learn about balance, guess what? You will never find the word balance in the Bible. Because God did not create us to balance life. He created us to strategically manage our time. Because our bodies are not even balanced. You get on a scale and it's going to give you a weight and you're going to get disgusted with it and you're going to want to break the scale and say, devil, you're a liar. I do not weigh that much. <laughs> but guess what? Hey, one calf is always going to be larger than the other calf. I don't care how much you work out. One arm muscle is always going to be bigger than the other one. Why? Because if you're left-handed, you use this one more. If you're right-handed, you use this one more. So there's never going to be a balance in your body. So why do we want to balance our life? How many of you have said that? God, if I could just balance my life, please just help me balance my life. That's, I know if I balance my life, everything will be great. And God convicted me, and he said, you'll never balance your life. 
How about you take the time that I've given you and use it wisely? I've set up a momentum for you. From multiplication, we went off like fire, right? We all got ignited. We, we all got something new stirred up within our spirit. And as I walked away, I'm like, man, how do I take this new with me? As I'm moving, as I'm moving, as I'm in this momentum. And I think about, um, if you look at the directional signs, and there's, you're going one way, and you know God's pouring down, and you're, you're, you're uh, calling out to him. So both of you are working this way. You're going, you're going, you, you're receiving, you're giving, you're going. And the momentum's happening, and you're just worshiping God. You're praising him for everything that he's doing. And then there comes another direction. You come up to this sign, and you're in the momentum, and then you're like, what? Wait, wait a minute. I, I was good. We were going good. We were, we were in it. I realize I can't balance my life. I have to manage the time that he's given me. So I'm in it now. We're, I'm going. And then life happens. We get hit with our kids, our husband, our loved ones. This series, On My Way, is out of the book of Daniel. And when I go to Daniel, I think about this, this guy was hit with many things. But the one thing I love about Daniel is he stood fast. He didn't let himself get swayed, even in the dens of lion. This weekend, I hit that directional sign. Put it back up. I was feeling good about my family, feeling great, we're moving, and boom, we got, some, we got a phone call, and we were told that a loved one has stage four cancer. This person is a rock in our family. And immediately, I broke down, I cried. I was beating on my bed, my husband didn't know what to say. And at that direction, no sign, I can fall back in depression or I can fall to the other side or do I stay in that middle course and continue to push forward? Because I've been there. I've been on both sides of this direction I've dealt with depression. I let it set with me for a year and a half, and no one ever knew. And I said, I can just go right back to that. I can get angry right now with God. I could turn my back on him in a matter of a second because you just screwed up my momentum. But you know what I did? I said, devil, you won't have victory. I will receive this notice, but this notice will not direct my path. I want to encourage you with two verses out of Mark eleven twenty four. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. I have declared and I am believing for the healing over my family member's life. Because I know that my God is a healer. And you know what? I'm even at the point that if he, if he takes her home, I know he healed her. I won't be angry with him. But I'm going to be thankful for what he's given me. My last verse I want to share with you, Hebrews 11, 1. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Guess what? I may not see that healing here on earth, but I know one day I have faith, I have confidence that one day 
I will see it. And you know what? I'm, re- I'm, I'm believing for the healing here on earth. And I'm declaring it. And tomorrow we have a visit with the doctor. But I know my God has a final report. So stay encouraged. Stay on the path. Don't be distracted by the directions that the enemy will try to take you down. All right, Destiny fam. Some very powerful stuff we've heard tonight. And I'm going to try to close this out like Kershaw in the ninth inning. You see, us as, as a church, going into this series, I'm on my way, we should, we should always go into something expecting. Matter of fact, our walk of faith should be an expecting walk. Why? Because expectation sets us up for preparation, right? If you don't expect anything to happen, you're not going to make room for it to take place. So expectation actually makes room for God to be real. We got to ask ourselves, are we expecting? What are we expecting? See, this series, I'm on my way, is going to be so powerful, and you've heard some of the pastors and what they're expecting, you got to ask yourself, what am I expecting? Because you've heard from the pastors, and you'll hear what I'm expecting as, as well, what Andrew's expecting, but you have to ask yourself as well, what are you expecting? What are you expecting God to do as you're on your way? Because in reality, we're always on our way. We just may not be on our way to the destination that we like. You could be on your way to regret, if we're honest, or we could be on our way by following the way, the truth, and the life, which is Jesus, who is the Word. Expectation should lead us to preparation, which makes room for the destination that God has for our lives. We should all come in expecting Matter of fact, I think expectation is acting while waiting. I'm going to say that again. Expectation is acting while waiting. So when you're expecting God to do something, either in this next series, tomorrow in your family, in your marriage, in your children, in your business, your job, you have to ask yourself, how am I acting while I'm waiting, because that actually reveals what you're expecting. Oh, come on, somebody. We have to prepare. We have to expect God to do something. Our level of expectation actually reveals the level of our faith. If we believe that God could restore our children, then we're going to expect God to meet our children. And so we're going to prepare to either love our children or prepare not just to make them come to church. Why don't you take church to them? I've been there, you know, where your parent makes you come to church, and I'm not saying that that is bad, but in some sense, I wanted church to come to me. If we're receiving love here, okay, we're receiving the powerful word. We, we have such anointed speakers that come here. Our lead pastors, Pastor Obed and Lisette, you know, we have a rabbi that's part of our staff. We get, we are so equipped. We are anointed. We are blessed. Come on, come on. We get fed well in this place. We get fed well here. But what we get fed here, we should take out there. Some of our children want the overflow of love that we receive here. We take it to them out there. We have the ability to take church to them. And again, what are we expecting and how are we acting while we're waiting? It's a healthy question to ask yourself. You got you to gotta ask yourself healthy questions. Great questions actually get great answers. Matter of fact, Jesus, when you read the Gospels, a lot of times the Pharisees or the Sadducees, they would approach Jesus with a question. And they were trying to question Jesus. 
But how could you question the walking answer? He called himself the way, the truth, and the life. How can you question truth? But it's amazing because he always rebuttaled with a question. It's a Jewish thing. <laughs> but it's good to ask you that. And matter of fact, that leads me to my main point of what I'm expecting. Not only out of this series on my way, because in reality, we're always on our way somewhere. If we're taking steps, because we are a church of steps, then we should always be, in some sense, on our way. But this, this series, what it's going to do is it's going to set us up to keep going. It's going to stir up uh, or continue, I should say, the momentum that Multiply has did inside of us. But this is what I'm expecting while I'm on my way. And maybe you can expect the same thing. I'm expecting this. I'm expecting to be challenged, and I'm expecting to be questioned. I'm expecting to be challenged, and I'm expecting to be questioned. And let me read a little bit of scripture to, to tell you why this is what I'm expecting. First of all, if you're not challenged, then you're not stretched. And if you're not stretched, then that means your capacity has not increased. And maybe God is trying to stretch you or increase your capacity so that he can actually position you for your destiny. So it's healthy to be challenged. Challenges stretch us. When's the last time you've been challenged? You have to ask yourself, challenges are what grow us. A long-distance runner is challenged with training. He doesn't just jump in the two-mile race and say, I think I could do it. He could enter the race, but he'll end short. And I think a lot of times we, we short ourselves or we come short because we're trying to jump into the race without being challenged, without being stretched, without our capacity being increased. So I'm believing that as I'm on my way in my walk of faith, that I'm going to be challenged, that I'm going to be questioned. Let me just read you. I got, I got six verses out of Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. It says, Jesus went into the synagogue again and noticed a man with a deformed hand. Since it was the Sabbath, Jesus' enemies watched him closely. You always know you're doing something when you got the attention of people. It goes on and says, if he healed the man's hand, they planned to accuse him of working on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the deformed hand, come and stand in front of everyone. Then he turned to his critics and asked, does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath or it is a day for doing evil? It's amazing how he rebuttaled with a question when they were waiting to accuse him. And it goes on and says, is this a day to save life or to destroy it? But they wouldn't answer him. And it goes on, it says, it says, he looked around at them angrily and was deeply saddened by their hard hearts. Then he said to the man, hold out your hand. So the man held out his hand and it was restored. At once the Pharisees went away and met with the supporters of Herod to plot how to kill Jesus. You see, it's amazing because this scene took place in the temple, the synagogue. And if you read in scripture, you'll find out that the Bible actually considers our body, us, as the temple. And, and follow me here because what I see here is a type and shadow of what goes on within the temple, within us. We question what Jesus wants to do in us and through us, just like they were waiting to accuse him for what he was going to do and how God was going to operate through him. They were going to challenge him. They always question him. And see, the only way you know you're doing something for God when you're on your way is when people start to question what you're doing. And the only reason they'll question what you're doing is because what you're doing is not what everybody else is doing. And if we think about the opposite, if they're not questioning what you're doing, then you're just doing what everybody else 
is doing and you're caught in culture you've been entangled by what everybody else is doing so it's okay to be challenged it's okay if somebody's wondering what you what you're going to oh you're going to church now now you go to church they can question you all you want it's only because they don't understand in that moment what Jesus has done to you or what he wants to do through you they will challenge you people will challenge some of your decisions that you make for God I remember I shared one time when I tithed and I shared with a buddy of mine and I said man I just kind of stepped out in faith and he knew what tithing was he had been to church he knew what it was and the minute I told him what I gave God he goes what you know what I could have did with that and I said yeah but do you know what God could do with that and he stepped back and I said when I put something in God's hands it actually does more than my own hands because when something's in God's hands it always increases but they challenged him while Jesus was on his way to the resurrection he kept being questioned and he kept being challenged you'll notice this again if you read within the Gospels so don't be alarmed if somebody's questioning what you're doing hey maybe right now your, your family doesn't understand that on a Wednesday night you've worked all day but you said hey I'm going to Destiny Church because I believe that I'm going to hear a word from God that's going to keep me going on my way. That's going to stir up my faith so that I don't give up and so that I could give in and keep on going. It's okay to be challenged on your way. Challenges are actually empowerment. Challenges empower you because there's something that it stirs up inside of you when you go through a challenge. I could imagine what Peter's faith was like when he got back in the boat after stepping out. I bet you his faith was on a whole nother level. Yeah, he may have been a little wet because he started to sink, but he didn't drown. And so, hey, you may get a little wet and you may feel like you're sinking while you're on your way, but you ain't going to drown. Expect to be questioned. Expect to be challenged. Pastor Obed and Pastor Jeff this Sunday are going to kick off this series. I'm on my way in. You'll notice, because they're going to talk about Daniel in the book of Daniel. You'll notice how many challenges Daniel had went through. And you know, right now in this moment, with every head bowed, every eye closed, I believe that there's somebody here tonight and they've questioned God because of the hardships that they've experienced. They've questioned him because of what's, what they've gone through and maybe you didn't ask for it, but you went through that and you're kind of misunderstanding why you went through that and you don't know if you can trust God and you've heard about Jesus and maybe you've heard your family talk about it or somebody told you that, hey, it all starts with Jesus. He died for your sins so that you could be forgiven and that forgiveness can break the chains of shame. Maybe you're feeling shameful right now. But hey, if you, if you would like to receive Jesus as your Savior, as your Lord, if that's you tonight, and say, I need that forgiveness. I've questioned it enough, but this time I just want to I want to step out in faith and I want to trust. If that's you, if you just want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, just lift your hand right now. Say, that's, that's me. I want to give him an opportunity in my life. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Praise God all over this place. Yes, amen. Come on, can we give it up for them, church? Now, for those of you who lifted your hand, first of all, God is so proud of you. 
Maybe you've never had a father say that he's proud of you, but I know God is proud of you. And matter of fact, God has been waiting on you with open arms. And so, hey, if you lift your hand, if you lifted your hand in faith, we as a church family want to pray with you. The Bible says in Romans, I believe it's chapter 10, it says that if you declare with your mouth and you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, it says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So right now, we want to pray with you as a church. So if you've lifted your hand, again, with your head bowed and your eyes closed, if you've lifted your hand, just repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for always loving me. I thank you for never giving up on me. I thank you for your son, Jesus, who died on the cross, but rose from the grave. I thank you, Father, that tonight I rise and that I am forgiven by the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that from this day forward, I will never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, give God a hand clap. Hallelujah.